Today is Dr. Max Crockmall. He's the assistant professor and assistant professor of history uh, at TCU. And uh, before I tell you a little more about him, I want to tell you a little bit more about our uh, our series. We're here uh, every uh, the first Saturday of every month, January through May, and then September through December. And if you're interested in learning more about our programs, you can visit our website at www.texas. Studies.org. Uh, if you don't receive emails from us uh, announcing our programs and you would like to, please make sure that I got your email address on uh, the sign-in sheet and I will be more than happy to add you to our email list so you'll get a little notification every month. We're able to bring you these programs through a grant from the Summerlee Foundation and they help us to provide great speakers like the one we have today. Uh, Dr. Krakmal uh, studies African American history, U.S. history, uh, Chicano and Latino, uh, Latino history, uh, and labor history uh, at, while he's at TCU. And he has a, a, a PhD from Duke before he came to join us at TCU. Uh, he's got a background in oral history and has uh, been able to glean a great deal of information that contributes to our study of the South and of race relations in America. So he's going to share with us about oral history, uh, black history, and democracy in America, and tell us a little more about how, uh, how about what he's done, about how oral history can help us learn more about history, and what you can do to participate. Thanks. Don't All right. Um, well, thank you, Leanna, for that great introduction, and um, thank you all for being here on an early Saturday morning. Um, I know it's not where we always want to be on a Saturday morning, but it's nice that we're all together. Um, I want to thank the Center for Texas Studies for having me and for the library for hosting this. Um, I'm going to talk probably for 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have some time for discussion. But if you're dying to ask a question in the middle, feel free to throw up a hand. Um, oral history, black history, and democracy in America. Um, so oral history. Why do we study oral history? Uh, I want to begin with you all waking yourselves up. Um, so please uh, t chat with your neighbor uh, and ask this question. Why should scholars collect oral history? And this other question, how is oral history different from history based on written sources? So we'll take, a, I don't know, two or three minutes. So please talk to a neighbor, and, and you, can, you can form a group of three if you want. OK, that's a good warm up. <laughs> Thank you all. So what are some of our answers? What, a, what did you all talk about? What, why should scholars collect oral history interviews? Who can help me out? Yes, sir. To get a better flavor of the environment and the way people interact with each other, we can from a written page. Okay, good. Get better flavor. Other thoughts? Good. You kind of get um, everybody's story with oral history, whereas um, the written stories are just based on like the dominant group or um, who's kind of in charge at the time. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? Why study oral history? Yes, sir, in the back. It adds to perception of identity, how people view themselves and the events that they're talking about. Okay, good. Ma'am? Well, and I was just going to say, it, um, it helps to keep it from being a biased perspective. Okay. It helps to hear everybody's perceptions and their experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's not just defined by one group. 
Okay, yeah, so everybody has a bias, but yeah. Uh, right. Written history, some people don't read the written history, so the oral part has to be passed over. Okay. The language part has to be passed over, so you get that richness. Mm -hmm. Right, and some people yes. don't leave behind written records at all. Most people don't. All right, how about the second question? How is oral history different from history based on written sources? The flavor, the, the liveliness, what other, what other ways might it be different? I'm just thinking about just the dialects that you hear okay. that you don't necessarily get when you read. Mm -hmm. Just the nuances of language. Okay, yes. It's often difficult to check accuracy of an oral history as opposed to a written record. Okay, but I'm going to argue that written records are as much or more fallible. Um, other thoughts? There's so many um, pr privileged institutions that um, support the written records, and with all, with that privilege comes the ability to um, construct her part of the story while ignoring the other sure. parts of it. Okay, good. Yeah, so you know, written sources get pre created at the time with one particular bias preserved. Uh, or not based on various power relations, um, kept for many, many years, then made accessible, all these different moments at which they're mediated. And oral sources are the same way, uh, but it does reach far more people, uh, or it has the potential to, as, as you all have alluded to. And the power of voice, I think, is an important point. You can, I'm gonna show you a couple clips today that you can, you can really feel the difference made um, by, by hearing the voice, uh, or uh, in addition to just reading the text. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to this place. You all are, are more advanced than some of my students. You have some sense of what you're doing here. Well, that, that's good. Um, but I wanted to quickly talk about what is and what isn't oral history. Um, we all know that we have traditions, oral traditions, stories that are passed down within our families, within larger cultures. Um, we have stories that go back you know, hundreds of years in some cases. Certain cultures are better at passing it down than others. We also have folkloric traditions, right? um, art forms, musical forms, uh, again, storytelling, uh, tales of how things happened in the past. And these are important, and they can be used by scholars. But they aren't really oral history in the sense of how scholars usually practice that today. Uh, instead, uh, oral history is more of an interdisciplinary field uh, that attempts to systematize and, and create a discipline out of how we go about collecting this information and do it in a way that other scholars can use and replicate. How do we get there? Um, many social scientific studies, uh, not just the Federal Writers Project, but many others, um, you know, did interviews as the basis for their research. Coming out of the Chicago School, we, we know a huge amount about social conditions in the early 20th century, thanks to uh, the research that social scientists did, the notes that they took, uh, and that's invaluable historical evidence. But again, it's not exactly oral history, right? It doesn't re reflect the words of the people who spoke them in their own language, uh, in their own recordings. Likewise, the, the narratives collected by the Federal Writers Project during the New Deal uh, are an invaluable source, but one that tends to muddle the, the voice of the narrators. Um, the most famous ones are the state folk histories. They, you know, they, they paid writers to go out and collect um, information, folklore, other kinds of stories. And, and published a series of state histories, which are a great source, and then most famously, the slave narratives. Um, we have an amazing amount of information from interviews with people who had been enslaved. Um, these interviews were conducted in the 1930s. They're amazing sources. Um, we do not have the original audio of those. In fact, all we have is notes and transcripts that were written up by the investigators in which they tried to record, for one example, the, the dialect that people used when they spoke. And so, um, in many ways, those sources tell us as much about the researchers as the researched. Uh, they're great about teaching us about slavery, but they also reflect some of the racialized thinking of the time. Um, in its modern form, oral history really took off after World War II, or yeah, right about after World War II. Alan Nevins at Columbia University first created a center designed to, to do oral history in a way that historians could count upon, meaning that we could go and listen to the interviews ourselves. We could verify the sources. We could replicate the data. Uh, he did it um, through presidential histories, interviews with great men, because um, most of history at that time was focused on great white men. Um, the new oral history emerges in the late 60s and 70s as a response to the civil rights movements. Uh, it became very apparent 
that what scholars thought they knew about black America was painfully inadequate uh, and that the movement on the streets forced the reexamination of the entire field. Um, you know, African American scholars had been, long been marginalized from the professions uh, and oral history was one way in which um, uh, their work became more accepted and also the sources that they drew upon became more accepted within the profession. Um, likewise, the women's movement, other movements in, the, in that period really pushed us to start interviewing ordinary people to look at oral history as a way to democratize the record, right? to create a, a, a broader source base reflective of all perspectives uh, and reflective uh, of you know, many sides of a story. Um, the biggest impact was on the history of the U.S. South. Uh, the scholarship on the American South in 1970 was not, let's say, terribly nonpartisan. <laughs> um, what, what would you think are some of the sources for Southern history in its traditional sense? Any guesses? What kinds of documents and pieces of evidence might we use? Newspapers, sure. Military records. Military records, okay. Any others? Okay, those are good. Good start, uh, right? Those are and um, newspapers were are, remain a huge source for historical research. Throughout most of American history, there was no pretense of objectivity for most newspapers, right? And so the newspapers that are tend to be preserved and that were used for these earlier studies were were partisan sources sources produced largely by uh, outlets in um, common with white elites. Um, that story begins to change with a couple of projects that emerge uh, right in the same moment, right around 1970, they begin. The Duke Oral History Project, which is now the Center for Documentary Studies, and the Southern Oral History Program at North Carolina. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work at the Center for Documentary Studies uh, on the more modern version of this project, and, and I'll talk more about that later. But these were the first ones that took it really seriously and said, let's go out and talk with ordinary people. Let's go interview African American activists about what the civil rights movement was about, about the period before. Let's go talk, about, talk to dissenters in the South, white dissenters who might not have um, you know, gotten along with the dominant culture. And, um, and these are the programs that really pushed for the acceptance of, of oral history as a valid type of historical evidence. So let me give you an example of how this works. Um, this is Anderson in Grimes County, Texas. Anyone been to Grimes County? No? Grimes County is kind of on the road from College Station to Houston. Not a place many of us go on purpose. Uh, <laughs> But it, this is a picture of it in 1915 of the kind of downtown square with the courthouse in the back. Uh, and it really looked about like that in 1900 when the, our story begins. And this is taken from Larry Goodwin's seminal piece in the uh, American Historical Review uh, called Populist Dreams and Negro Rights. Um, the story in short is that um, even as late as 1900, the idea of an interracial uh, coalition of black and white farmers and poor remained viable in some places throughout the South, including this county in East Texas. Um, there remained a, a, a vibrant uh, African-American Republican Party uh, and a growing insurgency of farmers, uh, white and black, who had then organized into the People's Party or the Populists. So the parties, of course, had very different meanings than they, did, they do now, right? That uh, African Americans overwhelmingly were Republicans because it was the party of Lincoln. Um, the Confederates were all Democrats, the former Confederates, white elites. And so for poor white farmers, they ended up needing a third party to advance their own interests. And their path to power was to form a coalition with, with African Americans in the Republican Party. Um, and so the way it played out in Grimes County was that Garrett Scott, uh, a white man who was a farmer uh, becomes elected county sheriff and he does it with the votes of African Americans. The way the coalition is sealed is that Jim Kennard, an African American, is on the ticket for district clerk. Uh, they appoint a number of black deputies in the sheriff's department as well as black tax collectors. So you can imagine um, these former Confederates who had been defeated on the field of battle 30 years earlier, still very upset about the, 
uh, abolition of slavery, still trying to find ways to discipline what they saw as their labor force and keep them working in the fields. And all of a sudden they have African American tax collectors showing up on their door and asking for taxes, uh, backed up by African American sheriff's deputies. So in many ways the, the reconstruction project was continuing at this local level and it happened in lots of places around the South. Um, the end of the story is that the white Confederate Democrats um, organize a group called the White Man's Union and I overthrow this coalition government. But I want to talk to you about how we got that story. So there's the old version, and this relies on those old southern sources. Um, newspapers, the Enterprise, are a main, uh, main source that had, had given us the history of Grimes County up until Larry wrote this article in 1971. Uh, the newspaper, for example, printed a copy of the notice from the White Man's Union um, when it first formed, calling for citizens to come and join. They called it an organization of the best citizens in the, st in the county who were uniting against what they called Negro rule. Um, very much a partisan newspaper, right? A, well, a newspaper that came to support this organizing uh, in the party of, party of white supremacy against this more democratic coalition. Um, as the newspaper reported it, the side they were fighting against was com composed of fluence men or influence men who were basically African American leaders who, who the paper thought were influenced by self-serving, populist, greedy white people to mislead other members of the African American race and to lead the people astray. Um, they also talked about the fact that teachers, African American teachers in this county made too much money and that that was a sign of the corruption. Uh, that the other side held meetings, that what they called owl meetings at night, that were, again, characterized by corruption, by drunkenness, by um, African Americans who were contradictorily both um, extremely influential and clearly not smart enough to do this on their own, <laughs> right? Um, so this is the version that was recorded into, into written history, right? And it was in the newspapers. It was later written down in memoirs by some of the, the members of the White Men's Union. It was passed down uh, into history books sometime shortly thereafter. And then later historians come along and cite those first history books. And then they get cited again and cited again. And so for decades, the story of Grimes County is one in which corrupt uh, populists um, are sort of cleansed by um, a more virtuous Democratic Party. Right? This is the story that becomes part of the official record. And it's based on these partisan and, as we'll see, violent white elite sources. Um, let's give some other examples. Uh, there was even indications in these partisan newspapers that the white man's union engaged in night riding, that they went out and visited uh, especially white farmers at night to try to force them into the union and out of the People's Party. They also, of course, attacked uh, African Americans. Um, there's a notice in the newspaper, for example, that, um, to, or to take another example, that a black Sunday school board statewide had planned to have a meeting in Navasota in, Gra Gra in Grimes County, excuse me, but they changed plans because they claimed that the county was no longer safe for African Americans. All these night riders had been forcing black farmers off of their farms. The paper responded in a, sup a supposed news piece calling it irresponsible slush, uh, that blacks were being attacked and forced out. But within a few weeks, the paper started reporting on these incidents themselves. Um, it reported on the murder of black populist leader Jack Haynes, who was attacked while working in the fields in front of his house, and District Clerk Jim Kennard, who was murdered um, within 100 yards of this courthouse. <laughs> Interestingly, the newspaper also reported on the death of another black populist leader named Morris Carrington. Uh, and the report just kind of said that he was attacked and killed. It didn't note his political affiliation or any of those ties. Um, clearly the purpose was to intimidate his supporters, but in reality he hadn't even been attacked and he ended up dying in 1923. Um, but the idea again was to, to push this, uh, this message across the county that populism was unsafe, that su uh, supporting the Republican Party was unsafe, um, and that anyone who didn't agree with the white man's union needed to get out of town. So this is a kind of a western crest with southern history, right? And it gets better. Um, so even reading against some of these newspaper sources, right, if you're really paying attention, you can understand that the story is a lot more complex, right, than, than 
the way the memoirs recorded it than the way that the Southern historiography had long recorded it. But the new story is based on oral sources with African American and white populists um, and Republicans. And that's a much more complicated story, as all of you indicated. Oral sources open up this whole new world of information. Um, what Goodwin discovered was that there were three distinct oral traditions in this community. One was uh, the white democratic tradition that gets recorded in these memoirs and passed along. One was the tradition of the Scott family, the, the white populists and his allies. And the third was of African Americans. And by using a multiracial or biracial team of researchers, he's able to go and talk with these different groups, with the children and friends and family of the people who were there in 1900. Um, these interviews revealed, for one, that this guy Carrington had not been killed, that he lived much later in life, and then they were able to verify that. Um, they revealed the full extent of the night riding of the campaign of terror and intimidation that the Democrats um, engaged in in order to win. And they also revealed a full and rather dramatic story of, of the takeover uh, of power. So by the time the election happened in November of 1900, so many African Americans and white populace had been run out of the county or forced to to subdue themselves, that there was no chance in the election. It was a landslide. Voter turnout dropped by 75% from the previous election, and the Democrats won. Um, but in sort of great American tradition, they did not wait for Inauguration Day to assume power. Instead, they assembled on horses and marched on this courthouse, uh, where they tried to come in and murder Sheriff Scott, the, the populist, and his remaining allies. The story that comes out of these oral sources shows that Scott stepped out of uh, a general store, right, next door to the courthouse, um, and was immediately cut down by sniper fire. His brother, who was in another store on the square, was murdered by the shopkeeper, who was a member of the white man's union. His sister, Cornelia, was held up in a hotel across the street, was watching the whole event happen, and she ran out into the street and screamed, why don't you shoot me too? I'm a Scott. She ran to her brother, who was the sheriff, who's laying in the street bleeding, and with her uh, seven-year-old son, dragged him across the street into the county jail. He wasn't yet dead, and in fact, he had some of his allies there inside the jail, and they began shooting back. Uh, the result was a five-day standoff in which um, the Democrats stood on one side of the plaza and the populace on the other, shooting at each other and, and waiting. And finally, a militia from Houston came and escorted the Scots and their allies out of the county for good. Um, so that's how populism dies in Grimes County. Hardly a, a democratic election as it had been portrayed, hardly the triumph of good government over bad. Um, so Goodwin's point was that for far too long history had been told based on these partisan, violent, written accounts. And that the oral histories not only supplemented that but actually corrected many of the inaccuracies within the written record. Um, so the contemporary sources um, were, were improved by these later oral histories. Obviously, the vivid stories are another benefit. Um, Goodwin writes, viewed as some sort of black abstraction, Jim Kennard, the black populist leader, might appear as some kind of convincing, shadowy fluence man. Um, but as an intelligent and determined voice of the aspirations of Negro people, he merits scholarly attention from perspectives not bounded by the horizons of those who murdered him. To an extent that is perhaps not fully appreciated, decades of monoracial scholarship in the South have left a number of Jim Kennards buried under stereotypes of one kind or another. So this is what oral history is all about. Right? It's about correcting these decades of inaccurate monoracial scholarship, reaching out to new sources, democratizing the source space, and getting the story right. All right, so here's another example. This is the Behind the Veil project. Um, based at Duke University, um, coming out of the same program. It really expanded in the mid-1990s, was the greatest period of, of field research, supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And teams of researchers fanned out across the entire South. So I think it was about 25 project sites, representative of different types of counties and cities, you know, everything from the old black town of Mound Bayou, Mississippi, to Memphis, to um, the panhandle of Florida to Charlotte, North Carolina, and kind of everything in between. Um, interestingly, they didn't have project sites in Texas, which is one reason our history remains so limited. Um, this is a project that studies uh, the Jim Crow period. So the subtitle of Behind the Veil is uh, 
you know, African American life in the Jim Crow South. Um, after the period of Reconstruction, after these decades of contestation, like, like the story I just told you about the populists, um, right, white Southerners impose a system of segregation that we have since called Jim Crow. Segregation was not about separating the races. Right? It was about imposing a system of white domination, and that that covered every aspect of life. Um, it you know, covered labor, what kind of jobs African Americans could have, obviously politics, obviously the segregation of public space, schools, um, and again, they weren't just separate. In every case, the facilities for African Americans were, of course, inferior. And so the, the, the point of all of those complex institutions of Jim Crow was not merely that they didn't want to rub shoulders, right? It was about controlling African Americans and, and African American labor. And for many years, uh, scholars understood this as a period of more or less successful domination by whites. Uh, as a period when African Americans had been so soundly beaten by the 1890s that when they did step out of line, they were lynched, and therefore, as a result, there was very little resistance. There was very little um, going on in the African American community that was other than kind of acquiescence or, at, the, at, at best, maybe accommodation with Jim Crow. Um, Booker T. Washington had put forward the idea that African Americans needed to advance within the system of Jim Crow, practice the industrial arts, all of these kinds of things. Rayford Logan, who's a preeminent African American historian, called the period the nadir of, Af of the African American experience, the low point, right? The moment when nothing was happening, when all they could do was kind of grit their teeth and bear it. Um, but W.E.B. Du Bois had a different conception that he called the veil, right? That um, there was a veil separating the white world from the black world, and that behind the veil, there was this whole other um, set of, of interactions happening. There was community building, there was a fluorescence of creative institutions, there was resistance too. There's a great poem uh, in The Souls of Black Folk in which he talks about it. And so the Behind the Veil pro project was focused on um, reaching out to African Americans who were elderly, who had lived through this uh, period in the 90s, um, the goal is to get to as many as possible before they started passing away, and to see if what common themes might emerge from these interviews. If we could take, you know, really hear African American voices about the Jim Crow South, how would that period look different? What, is, what does life look like on the other side of the veil, rather than just focusing on interactions across the color line? Uh, and so they conducted 1,300 interviews. Um, and the re research revealed a rich history of institution building, as well as resistance among African American communities throughout the whole Jim Crow period. So long before we get to the Civil Rights Movement, there's all sorts of creative community building going on. Um, we see, um, first and foremost, the, the, uh, the institution of family and extended family and kinship ties that are a source of strength for African Americans who are trying to survive the indignities and violence of Jim Crow. Of course, African American churches are built and expanded during this period as another source of strength and autonomy for African Americans. All black neighborhoods, despite having a lack of public services and um, police terror and other side effects uh, of, of Jim Crow, or maybe not side effects, direct effects of Jim Crow, the neighborhoods themselves could foster a degree of, of collaboration and creativity that, that helped to uh, African Americans to live well uh, with dignity, I don't want to say it was great, but right, but live well to resist some of the worst indignities of life in the Jim Crow South. African Americans built a rich associational life, right? Uh, fraternities, sororities, uh, Masonic lodges, the Knights of Pythias and the various other societies, mutual benefit societies for burials or for, um, you know, just support uh, in times of need. Uh, labor unions, African Americans built all black labor unions in many places. Um, some of these benefit societies produced large black owned insurance companies, banks. Um, I lived in Durham, North Carolina, which for a long time was known as the uh, capital of the black middle class in America. There's a black Wall Street in Durham where there's uh, the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company as well as the Mechanic and Farmers Bank, two of the richest African American institutions, and that these institutions provided support for all these other types of community building activities. Of course, there are black newspapers, African American political associations of all shapes and sizes. And the other thing we discovered through these, this project was that 
the more personal forms of resistance was, were virtually everywhere in the Jim Crow South. What James Scott and, and Robin Kelly since have called infra politics, like smaller forms of everyday resistance, rather than going away during this period of the Nadir, it actually was near ubiquitous, right? So that African Americans, rather than being passive victims, were active agents in resisting the Jim Crow South. And so I wanna give you all, um, play a couple clips for you and you can kind of hear that and also the complexity that goes on. So let's do, um, let's actually do the other one first. Yeah, thanks. I'll take just a second. Okay, so there are clearly examples of resistance, right, that w white scholars um, like the white bosses had sort of taken at face value this mask that people put on for survival. But behind the veil is a different story, a story of resistance, of a hidden transcript of resistance. Uh, let's do the other one. So, um, you know, clearly a lot going on in that excerpt as well, right? Uh, our, our normal conception of the Jim Crow period is one in which African Americans just can't vote when there's all these obstacles to voting, and he reinforces that, right? Clearly that's what, what you ran into, but he also shows um, some depth about what, how white paternalism operated, that the way that they could grant the vote as a favor to, to certain African Americans and, and therefore have, um, those, those people are obligated to pay it back in some way, pay back that favor. Uh, and he also talks about the divides within the, within the African community, African American community about having to do with class, having to do with these different political strategies, right? Is it okay to vote just um, 
as part of this uh, sort of patronage from white elites, or do you need independent political power? Right? So all of these interviews, that's just a couple examples of the, of the richness, of the complexity that, is, that it reveals on the other side of the color line. So while there are all these rich institutions um, and, and community building, upbuilding going on, um, not everyone agreed. Right? That, there, that we can't over-romanticize the African-American community. There's differences about integration, about the type of political action. There's class differences, ideological, uh, other differences that divided the African-American community behind the veil then as it does now. Right? And so that's another great use of oral evidence to reveal some of that complexity uh, that you might not be able to get even from a black newspaper, right? because they're, they're pushing one of those political perspectives. Um, we're working on a book coming out of this, and we'll see if it ever gets done, but hopefully. Um, last example I want to mention, and I'm going to probably cut this a little short, but the, the historiography of the civil rights movement has been alter unalterably transformed uh, thanks to oral history uh, as, as a new source. Um, early civil rights history was, was based almost exclusively on newspaper reports and largely from um, the sort of traveling national civil rights press corps the New York Times and some of the other major dailies who did cover the struggle. These are all sources that Charles Payne calls the rough draft of history, right? And that rough draft helped us to get some sense of what mattered, right? It gave us, uh, and, and that media coverage helped the movement immeasurably, right? The, they brought media attention to places like Birmingham and that really did help create change. Um, but since Bill Chafe's book on Greensboro and most, most influentially this one, John Dittmer's Local People, uh, which was published in the mid-90s. And, and the third is Charles Payne has a book called I've Got the Light of Freedom. Those, the publication of those two books about the same time uh, really pushed scholars to prioritize the perspectives of local people, local activists in counties across the South who, it, who built the civil rights movement themselves. And, and what does it look like from their perspective? How did they get recruited into the movement? Um, what did it look like in terms of the, the, the federal government? Was it supportive or not in, in the ways that they needed it to be? Um, what were their relationships uh, across the color line? What were their relationships um, with traditional black elites? And all of these other sorts of questions. And what was revealed was um, that this focus on local people gave us this new perspective on organizing um, the process, the nuts and bolts of organizing the movement. Um, it, it shed a lot of light on the importance of collective leadership rather than the charismatic sort of top-down leadership we often associate with Dr. King and with the movement um, more generally. Uh, one thing that, that comes through very clearly from these interviews is that the movement was not simply about integration, but about, uh, or not even just access, but about real political power, about economic opportunity, um, that the agenda of many on-the-ground activists was much broader than the way that the reporters for the New York Times could see. Um, they used a greater range of tactics. Um, and that we see that there's a movement going on other places, right, outside the South. Increasingly, we're learning about freedom struggles in the North and in the West. Um, and we're looking further back in time and further forward in time. It's not just from the Brown versus Board decision or Montgomery to Memphis. It, we're now looking back into the 1930s for some of the origins of the struggle in different places and forward into the 70s to see the way that even after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, uh, African Americans struggled for integration, for political power, for economic uh, equality, and so forth. So there's been a revolution in civil rights history in the last 15, almost 20 years now. Um, and I can, I'd be happy to talk about some of those other books and, and what we've learned from it. Um, to go back to one of the things I mentioned, the federal government does not come through as a great ally in this book. Right? So the story that John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson you know, gave African Americans their civil rights has no actual basis, in fact, once you get down to the level of, of the stories of local people. And in fact, it, you know, it's very much the opposite. They consistently uh, supported order uh, over justice and left activists high and dry where they were beaten and killed. Um, so here's another example, and this is a more local example from my research in San Antonio. Um, this is the sort of scholarly, the, the, the most known scholarly article on civil rights in San Antonio is by a guy named Goldberg. He calls it racial change on the southern periphery. Goldberg says, basically, segregation wasn't all that bad in San Antonio, right? It wasn't no Mississippi, which is true, 
but it's not exactly how certain local folks experienced it. He says segregation wasn't that bad. The way that it eventually disappeared was that African American uh, traditional elites uh, were able to negotiate with their white counterparts in business, and that white business elites were really rather enlightened, you know, that they could see what was happening in other places in the South, and they thought, well, we really want to avoid that kind of conflict. We want to avoid that bad publicity. We don't want to hurt the bottom line. So we're going we're gonna to negotiate with these black elites. And even before the Civil Rights Act, Goldberg says, they agreed on a plan of, of voluntary integration, meaning that these businesses would decide to integrate kind of gradually and on their own and without force of, of protest or without force of government action. Um, this story renders the, the black protests that happened fairly invisible, right? That those that were there were largely marginal. Once in a while, they created a little heat, but mostly they were just kind of crazy, right? The NAACP in San Antonio, not a major player. It was really a couple of, a church leader and a, and, a, and a teacher who went behind closed doors and negotiated this deal. He also tells some stories about the history of black-brown conflict, between, conflict between African Americans and Latinos in, in San Antonio. In contrast, the interview I did with Reverend Claude Black Jr., who was a longtime leader of the local chapter of the NAACP, is a pretty different story. And I don't have time to play the whole thing for you, but uh, Reverend Black talked about how segregation worked, how he experienced it, right? As a system of domination. It wasn't an idea or a thing, he told me, right? It was about making you feel inferior. It was all these daily indignities that he experienced, right? Including a lack of job opportunities. Um, Right, bad schools, all the, well, maybe not bad schools, but poorly resourced schools, right? All these various ways in which segregation was experienced. And so when you listen to him talk about it, segregation in San Antonio, you know, maybe it wasn't as often enforced by lynch law, but it was every bit as bad as it was anywhere else in the South. There was nothing peripheral about it. In Reverend Black's view, the back, black businessmen that go about negotiating uh, ostensibly on behalf of the African American community weren't, didn't really have the community's best interests in mind. They weren't committed to integration. They were committed to maintaining their position as intermediaries and to getting ahead financially. Uh, in Reverend Black's view, white elites were anything but enlightened. The last thing they wanted was integration, um, and they fought it. They didn't just decide one day we're going to gradually integrate. And in any event, gradual voluntary integration for Reverend Black was, was not acceptable. Right? He didn't want to be given integration. He wanted it as a right. He also talked about how coalition building with Latinos in San Antonio proved critical uh, to the struggle. So Renee, if we could play that clip now. And it, we had trouble embedding it, so we're gonna just play it in this other program for you. I think other, the last sentence was, otherwise you've got a job to do. <laughs> right? If you don't have it as a fighting right, as he calls it. Right? Reverend Black's story does not support any of the assertions that Goldberg makes. 
Right? It's a fundamentally different story. And it's a story told by the guy at the center of the civil rights storm, right? the guy who was leading demonstration after demonstration, the guy who was uh, sitting in at City Hall, the guy who was going there and screaming at the council every week, you know, the one who um, pastored one of the largest and, and um, most active churches in San Antonio's east side, right? the one who had been engaged in fighting for economic justice issues, for fighting for neighborhood improvements, um, you know, for, for decades, right? This guy knows what the struggle's about, not Goldberg, right? And Goldberg's sources included some oral evidence, but for some reason, he didn't listen to them, from all I can tell, right? Um, the story Reverend Black tells is one about conflict. It's not one about consensus between white and black elites, uh, right? And he does, he mentions Hispanics. He, meant, he talks about how um, there are some commonalities there. Um, interestingly, in the larger interview, the, the story is not that they have much in common, but that they found ways to work together because they needed help. <laughs> um, and I can talk more about that later because that's a big part of my, my current book project. Um, so, looking at North Texas uh, and the civil rights history here, we have a lot of the same stories, right, um, in both Dallas and in, in Fort Worth. That here, you know, business leaders, Leonard's and others, you know, decided that, that Integration, that segregation was too expensive, and so they, they thought they'd change the plan uh, before anything bad could happen. As it says here, I suspect this is also a myth. Um, and there's, I have a little bit of evidence, right? We clearly have saw sit-ins in 1960 and 61 in both cities. Uh, there were marches, there was a lot of independent political activism going on, voter registration campaigns, efforts to equalize and improve schools, um, efforts to integrate the schools, as some of you are researching. Um, you know, and, and where we're at now is that we just need more, more oral evidence in order to get the record straight. Um, the story in, in Houston is actually very similar. There's a book by a guy named Tom Cole that, that makes the argument that the movement was rather short and truncated, right? It, it, and it largely got fixed when um, the whole problem of segregation was fixed when black and white businessmen got together and cut a deal in order to build a, a baseball stadium that could accommodate integrated players. You know, so the birth of the Astros desegregated Houston, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, this is a guy who I've been writing about named Moses Leroy, who um, just dealing with his whole life story shatters all of that. Not just how the change happened in that moment, but the chronology of the movement, what was at stake, the agenda, um, you know, its relationship with other marginal groups. So just real quickly, this is his bio. He was. Um, he was there for the Camp Logan riot in 1917. He was working downtown when, when there was the race riot coming out of, uh, of the barracks there. Uh, he worked at the Southern Pacific Railroad as a laborer uh, and joined the all-black auxiliary of the Brotherhood of Steamship and Railway Clerks, a, a labor union. He was an officer in the local chapter of the NAACP uh, and the, sort of the liaison between the, all, all the black AFL unions and, and that chapter. And what happened in, in Houston in the late 40s was a vibrant uh, movement that combined um, what we think of as civil rights demands with, with labor demands, with economic uh, justice organizing. It was a chapter led by Lulu White, and there's a wonderful biography of her that helps to shed light on some of this. And out of that came some of the path-breaking cases that changed um, the national civil rights story. The Smith versus Allwright case, which ends the uh, all-white primary for voting in the Democratic primary, and, uh, and the sweat uh, case, which is uh, the desegregation of higher education and was a key precedent for Brown. Um, the Leroy's are involved in the Progressive Party, which is kind of a left-wing interracial party in 1948, outflanking Harry Truman on his left. Uh, and after these organizations kind of go into decline with the rise of the Cold War, he helps to found the Harris County Council of Organizations, which is a cross-class, multi-issue black political coalition. Right. Um, and it's the way forward for these activists. So the struggle starts in Houston, I would argue, in the 1930s uh, with the, this, this vibrant NAACP chapter and all these black union members. Uh, and it continues forward despite uh, the rise of the Cold War. His wife is also an activist, Irma Leroy. She's the first African American to run for the state legislature in 1949, African American woman. And again, a chapter leader of the NAACP. Um, by the 60s, Moses Leroy, even though he was starting to look like that, was involved in the sit-ins with a bunch of students, right? Um, he helped to found the Texas Council of Voters, which if you know um, Jack, Dr. Jack Brooks, uh, attorney uh, W.J. Durham, uh, 
are leaders of that organization statewide. Leroy is the Houston leader, right? And they're the ones that go out and register African Americans in mass in the 1960s and are able to really assert uh, themselves as a, as a viable political bloc. They, he's part of a multiracial coalition in the 60s that I'm also writing about. After the Civil Rights Act is passed, he leads the fight uh, the, uh, to get equal employment opportunity at the Southern Pacific Railroad and also sues his union for the longtime practice of segregation. He becomes a leader in the war on poverty in Houston and the Model Cities program. He's in his 60s by now, and he still goes on this march from uh, the Rio Grande Valley to Austin. It's 400 miles long, and he participates in the whole thing with all these Chicano farm workers, right? So clearly it's like a much bigger, broader, longer movement and we know that because of his oral testimony and other documents we're able to use to verify that. And of course, famously, Barbara Jordan right, comes out of the, that political organizing in Houston um, and, and this group called the Harris County Democrats that, that, again, Mr. Leroy was part of. All right. So I think I've shown you why oral history matters, hopefully by now. You can see what, that how much it has deepened and expanded African-American history and how much it has really influenced Southern and, and American history much more broadly. Right? It fundamentally democratizes the historical record. Most people don't leave behind written records. So if we go out and re record these, we have new sources we can draw upon. And, and when I record an interview, it goes into an archive where someone else can use it you know, decades down the road and, and, and use it maybe for entirely different purposes. It, um, it, we, we are building for the first time a multiracial source base for doing American history, and it's changing what we think we thought we knew about it, right? Based on the sources available to Goldberg and to Cole, they thought integration in San Antonio and Houston wasn't no thing, right? They thought it was an easy uh, negotiation between black and white elites. But by interviewing the activists, we get a, a very different story. So it's correcting some of the faulty sources produced at the time. To give one example, the Dallas Morning News reported absolutely nothing on the sit-ins. There was a complete blackout. And the Houston Chronicle did a similar thing for one wave of the sit-ins down there. They decided, we aren't going to report on it. It'll go away. Clearly not consensus, right? <laughs> but um, we get to a deeper, truer story. Right? We get past those myths of consensus. We see the, the depth of resistance, the agency of marginalized communities. Um, and we're able to, to, to broaden where we're looking. Like, that the civil rights movement was concerned in the 1940s with jobs just as much as it was in the late 60s and early 70s is something that we're just starting to understand. And we're doing it because of this new oral evidence. Let's see, what do I have next? Uh oh. All right, so I'm going to talk real quickly. Wow, that's not where I meant to go. Okay. I'm going to talk real quickly about how we're doing this. Um, so I am starting this program called the Texas Communities Oral History Project. Uh, it's based at TCU. And Leanna, if you could grab those handouts for me, that'd be great. That some of you might have grabbed one of these on the way in, but for those of you who have not, we'll be circulating them now. Um, we have a pilot project currently underway, a group of 10 researchers who are doing different projects on local uh, civil rights history and, and history of community organizing and activism. It, look, it looks like we're going to do one project on, um, on Mexican-American activism and then a couple on African-American activism. Um, but we're trying to conduct interviews uh, with these different communities, with African Americans, Latinos, labor leaders, uh, liberal political activists of all colors, uh, and, and really try to democratize Texas history in the way that much of the rest of Southern history is, is actually far ahead of us. Uh, and where these interviews will go is to a library archive, but it'll also have, we're, we're doing it all digitally, so there'll be a free, uh, freely accessible public history website, and the website will include the full interviews, uh, it'll include clips of the interviews that are kind of thematically organized, so you can learn about a particular topic if you want. Uh, and it includes short interpretive essays, you know, trying to make sense out of all this evidence so that teachers and others can use it in their classrooms uh, and, and, you know, that people can use it with their own families uh, or on their own just to learn a little bit more uh, about the subject. So if any of you are at all interested in that project, uh, there's a, I have a, a, a separate sign-in sheet for that by the door. I have some more copies here. Or come talk to me afterwards. Um, we very much are looking for the right people to interview. Um, and we need people to help us do the interviews, and we can provide the training. So if you want to be interviewed, or you have friends you think need to be interviewed, or 
people you know in the community that need to be interviewed, please let us know about that. If you yourself want to be part of collecting the interviews, that's going to be something that will be available as well as we move forward. Um, the question, who do we still need to interview? Right? There's a lot of people out there that have information about these stories that we need in order to get the record right. right? If, we're, if we're democratizing the historical record, the purpose is to democratize our current society. right? And the only way we can do that is if we have an accurate and truthful um, reconciliation about what actually happened in the past. We're not going to come into this great post-racial democratic society if we still think that conflict didn't occur. right? We, we need the records. Uh, and we need your help in collecting them, because there's so many people out there to talk to. Um, so before we get into uh, some practice, we have a little time here. And uh, I just wanted to know if you all had any questions about anything I've said so far before we plow forward. Questions or comments about, about my presentation? Yeah. Dr. Paul, what is the work being done to get these histories into the hands where they would benefit students most? Yeah. So I would say that the profession was slow to do that, right? That um, for many, many years we recorded interviews on cassette tapes. Those cassette tapes were stored in a climate controlled vault somewhere and um, only specialists had access to them. Uh, part of this Texas Communities project is to, to, we're getting money for digitization of some of those old resources, but also all the new interviews are being done in, in digital formats so that they can immediately become part of, of a publicly accessible archive. Uh, and that the archive, you know, we want it to be user friendly so that if, you, if you're the kind of person who wants to listen to two hour interview, you can, but much more people just want clips about whatever subject they're interested in. Uh, and, and, you know, not full lessons or modules, but, but areas where there's a bunch of documents together that they can use. So we're trying to come up with new ways to, and there's a center in Kentucky that's really been the leader of this and also a place in, in Rochester, New York, but new ways in which we can index these interviews and, um, and make them more useful like that. Make sure much easier to search, much easier to find things. So that when you're on our site, you know, what we'd like to have is something like the Amazon engine where you know, if you're watching one clip, it kind of shows you on the bottom, here's five other clips that are re related, right? And that makes it easier for you to use it. Um, we also are collecting you know, rare documents. People that have collections in their attics or wherever at their house where they have newspaper clippings or photographs or, or flyers or um, meeting minutes or all these kinds of things. We're collecting and digitizing all of those as well. Yeah. <laughs> Broadly, okay. um, I mean, I think our main interest is, uh, you know, with questions of race, class, and gender. But it's, um, I'm personally also interested in in just the the process of community organizing for, for social change. And so that the interviews are designed to collect some of that nuts and bolts information about how people come together and and ordinary folks are in, in, engaged in really changing the world around them. So. Anybody that wants to talk about that, we'd love to, to hear from it. And then we also do interviews with you know, political leaders and some of, at the local level, some other kinds of community leaders who might have been involved with some of these same issues. Um, but my main interest is in, is in finding ordinary people, <laughs> in quotes, whatever that means. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Um, what we need is community members to get involved and to help us figure out who we need to talk to um, and, and you know, make some of those new contacts. So, um, if you if you like this uh, woman, support the project. Please help us, however you can. <laughs> Any information you have or other. The interesting thing about Goodwin's story is that he was working uh, as an activist himself in the Democratic Party, the le liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and um, you know they were going out and doing meetings all over the place. And at some of these meetings they had in African American communities in rural East Texas. Um, Throughout the 50s and 60s, there would be this kind of hesitation among some of these older African-American small farmers, right? And then um, the meeting would end and they'd kind of tentatively come up to the front and, and ask them these questions uh, having to do with populism, right? And which side they were on, basically, back then, right? These are guys who had been through earlier struggles or who their parents, they grew up with these stories around them. And, uh, and so they, they were, as part of sizing up whether they could build an interracial alliance in the 1960s, they, they were referring back to that history. And so Goodwin set out to better understand the populist struggle 
it was going to be a chapter in a larger work on the civil rights movement, and it didn't end up, yeah. The story about the, the events in that county uh, played out many times sure. throughout, throughout the South, and, yeah. and there was a, 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 a local instance of that here in, in Tarrant County, Fort Worth, during the Great Southwestern Strike, uh -huh. 1886, 87, and the Knights of, all that kind of emerged from the Farmers Alliance and the Knights of Labor. Yep. And that was that that kind of alliance uh, was tried over and over again with similar results. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a repeated uh, sure. theme uh, throughout the uh, latter part of the 19th century. And, and if you read the local papers here, uh, you can find interviews with, with these folks, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some of the uh, leaders, uh, African American leaders, in the, in the Farmers Alliance, and. Uh, Especially the Knights of Labor, where they tend to be more prominent. Sure. Uh, uh, about uh, you see how push you can do oral histories of these folks, but you can't. It's interesting how the, some of the local papers seem to have made it, uh, some attempt to uh, give an, an objective account of who these people were and what they said. You can get uh, a fairly good account of them. Well, and we had there were populist newspapers in Texas yeah, there, there in were, that period as well. But yeah, but these were local Democratic Party newspapers. Yeah. Depending on who is in charge, sometimes. You populist leading wing of the party right. who would give these people a fair hearing. Right? So yeah, I mean, a good example of lo learning our history further back too, I mean, locally in civil rights history, uh, Mansfield uh, was a place where um, mob rule stopped integration of schools in 1956, and the governor and the president um, conspired to, to prevent that. You know a little about that? <laughs> I actually grew up during that time. Okay, well we need to talk. <laughs> but go ahead. Uh, I grew up in Mansfield where the school was, was definitely segregated. It was mm -hmm. all black. Uh, the school now is in a church, but it was an all black school. Mm -hmm. To, for Mansfield to get, you had to go up to the black school. For Mansfield, then you bus to I and Turtle. Mm -hmm. And that's where I grew up doing that area. All the way coming in here. Wow. Yeah, um, or you know, Cleburne, Texas, where the populists had one of their first big meetings and, and radical demands, or the Knights of Labor. So we have a lot of that history locally, and please do talk to us. We'd love to hear more. <laughs> you was talking about Grimes. Yeah. My grandfather was in Grimes in, in the 1880s. My, my father was born in 1886. So you're talking about yeah, descendants from slavery. I mean, I'm just one hop away from it. Sure. So that's one of the researches I'm doing on. Great. Yeah, and they probably had some ties to that that Black Republican Party in that period. Um, it, maybe his parents or something as well. Um, that's a great story. <laughs> uh, other questions or comments? So the question of who can collect oral history sources. This may be a rhetorical question. The answer is any of you, right? <laughs> so um, what I would like to do today is just give you an example of what that's like and sort of uh, demystify that process. Thanks, y'all. Um, how does one conduct an oral history interview? So again, if you could find someone in the audience to talk to, preferably someone you don't know, um, try asking each other some questions and uh, kind of just see what their answers are and what you learn from it. And we'll take about 10 minutes to do that and, and just see if we have anything cool we learn in the process. So. <laughs> Okay, everybody. <laughs> so please wrap up your interviews. We can reconvene real quickly. <laughs> Who can share with me something that they got from one of their from their partner that they talked to? Who wants to tell me an interesting story they just learned? Yes, sir. Well, what I learned about this gentleman is about you know we talked a little bit about how oral history is passed down and. 
how our children is now going to social media mm -hmm. and a lot of the oral history is being taken away because they're decentralizing it. And mm -hmm. for instance, General Motor how it's the epic center of number three largest car manufacturer in the United States and a lot of our children don't know that because the oral history is not being passed down. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. What else? What other stories did you all tell each other? Or what, what, did you, what did you talk about? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I have a very interesting one. And I'd like all of you to meet Christine White. And she told me the story about her uh, grandfather, who was Travis Willis. No, Chavis. Chavis, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. And there's a documentary on him on PBS made in the 1980s about the problems he had with people who took away his land in East Texas. Great. So, well, thank you. Is, is that Chavis related to the other Chavises of North Carolina? No? Actually, he, my, when we were, my granddaddy was such an intelligent person. Uh, he came, we came from Africa to Virginia. That's how we mm -hmm. slave in down through Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not, not, not Carolina to okay. college. Not the Ben in Chavis. The area. Mm -hmm. Okay. The area. Well, that's a great story. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess just in my course of conversations with him, I really enjoy when he talks about um, the union, not the union, but the, the department within where we working, that they, they were like, no, you can't be a part of this, and how he made choices in order to, to become a part of it. Um, machinery? Machinery. Jobs. So tell, machinery yeah, jobs. Tell, tell us a little more about that. Well, I was told that blacks wouldn't allow in the machine shops. So when you tell me I can do something, I got more inspired to do it. Sure. Uh, took me two years. But once I broke into the machine shop, I opened doors for the next generation, which to me I was the stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Stayed in this company 13 years. And right now, the young boy there, my name is not forgotten. <laughs> I, I opened doors for there wasn't doors to be open for young black men at the time, mm -hmm. uh, as far as being supervisors. Uh, uh, over, the, over the machines, stuff like this, anywhere that they said that you could not go, uh, it made me want to go. <laughs> so, but there's, even at Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. I worked there for some time, uh, I was told that I couldn't go into this particular shop because it was, Mm -hmm. off limits. Well, I didn't make it, but I gave it really a fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of the things that I bought, uh, never really thought about, mm -hmm. you know, as being part of history. It's something that yeah. went down. Well, that is, that is very much a good part of history that we would love to record. Um, right? the, as I mentioned, the struggle for jobs and for economic improvements, for upgrading positions, for opening doors for others, is a central part of the history that we're just beginning to understand better. And that's because it's locked in people like your heads and we haven't gotten it out yet. <laughs> we need to get it out and down on paper and recorded. Uh, any other ones? Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, this nice lady in front of me, I uh, found out that she's from Fort Worth, was born, raised in this area, and attended schools here her whole life. And also, her, uh, she traces her ancestry all the way back to slavery. And her particular family members, I believe it was on your father's side, on her father's side, were, were uh, runaway slaves. They ran away and they were gained their freedom wow. from being runaway slaves. So she's, uh, she has that documented. That's great. And, and again, like the oral tradition of your family and passing that story along is something that we also need to record. And, and especially if you have other things to support it, that's, that's invaluable. So please do talk to someone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't get a chance to talk about mine, but right now um, I wanted to speak about the urban villages and the renaissance that's going on in Fort Worth right now okay. as it pertains to the urban villages, West 7th Street, renaissance at Rosedale, and all the things that are going on, so your time is perfect. OK. Um, where do you work that you're working on that or what is it? Uh, over at the uh, Polytexas Westland area. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, 
Well, thank you all so much for coming out today. And uh, here's some more resources if you want to do some more studying on it. And on the way out the door, uh, we have, uh, again, a sign-up sheet for, for this project, for the Texas Communities Oral History Project. So if you want to be on the mailing list, um, you know, email or paper, fill that out. Uh, if you'd like to help the project in any way, either by giving an interview um, or by conducting interviews, there's a, form, a place on the form where you can specify any of that. But please do sign up for the mailing list at the very least. And I'd love to stay in touch. So thank you very much.